weeks ago when we were here last, but we haven't really, really covered it to my satisfaction. Um, if you don't have any notes, Mr. Dot, there's some back there on the communion table on what we're going to cover this morning. Every Sunday morning, whenever I do notice, they'll be back there on the table. But we're looking at the gift that Christ gave to the church. And when we're looking at the church, Christ didn't leave us powerless, but he made sure that he gave us everything we needed to continue on. We're looking at church government right now, and we're, we've looked at it based on Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. We find this further elaborated on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, where the Bible reads, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gives the healing, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. And diversity of tongues is what we're going to cover this morning. I know I handed out notes last time we met, but these are a little bit more descriptive, or I should say a lot more than descriptive than last time, because when we look at tongues as a church, and not just as a church, but the tongue and the gift of tongues gets confused when it comes to the church world. And the reason is, it's very easily easy to do so when we're studying the Word of God. Is he discussing tongues? Is he talking about diversity of tongues or the gift of tongues? What are we discussing? And so many times I find that we confuse the two and we get them overlapping. So today, hopefully, we can be able to sit down and have a group discussion a little bit more and be able to pull these things apart. Now, when we look at the tongue, it is extremely important when we study the Word of God. Because if we go back to the garden, how many languages were there in the entire world? One. People may argue there was the male language and the female language, but that's a whole other debate. But there was one language. If we come to the time of Noah, we know that there was a great population. Some would even speculate that there were more people in the world during the time of Noah than there are right now. How many languages were there during the time of Noah? One. And you're right, it's not there. There's only one. But where did all the language, different languages come from? Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. And why do we have so many different languages at the Tower of Babel? What's going on? They were the Absolutely. In fact, let's step back and define evil in this sense a little bit more. Because when we look down at it, people will define evil in different ways. If we look and talk about sin, well, somebody that doesn't that lies, well, they're different. That sin's not as bad as somebody who killed somebody, but yet sin is sin in God's eyes. So what are we talking about with evil? When we talk about Tower of Babel, it's not that they were going around killing everybody or blowing everybody up, but rather their evil was disobedience towards God. God told them to scatter, go forth and multiply, and they basically were a stubborn three-year-old that said, no, Dad, I'm not going anywhere. And they stayed in their location. The evil was disobedience to God. They did the opposite of what God told them to do. He told them to go forth, scatter, and multiply, and they refused to do that. The other evil thing we find that rose up in their heart was pride. I, was, I would call it pride. Basically, Brother Eli, they said, you know what, God? You flooded the world before, so we're going to build this tower not to reach you, not a staircase or a ladder to heaven like Jacob might have saw, but rather we're going to build our tower just a little bit above where the water line was. And when the water comes, we'll stand here and go, na, 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 you can't touch us. That was basically the mindset. When you studied out the tower that was supposed to reach to heaven, wasn't heaven where God is, but heaven in the skies. And the level was just above where God had the level, water level before. So the problem with Babel was disobedience towards God and rebellion against God. They did not do what God said. That was the evil there. So God said, you know what? These people are going to do whatever they want, whatever. And if we're going to put it in biblical times, in the back, going back to the book of Judges, 
Every man did what was right in his own eyes. But they were doing what they wanted, not what God told them to do. And God said, you know what? I'm going to come down and confuse your language. And then you're going to have to go forth and scatter our cross. Because, Brother Eli, you're not going to be able to talk to Brother Justin. And Brother Eli, you're not going to be able to talk to Sister God. And Sister God, you're not going to be able to talk. So, you know, the confusion, the, um, I don't want to say annoyance, but um, frustration. Because one of the largest things that I find when I travel is the language barrier. I can live, I can adapt to even, but man, if I can't communicate, then we're in a whole different boat. But God can that and he can use the language because of their evil, their disobedience, and that's when the language changes. Now, God used the human tongue to <coughs> to divide the people, but at Pentecost we see something completely different. When God came down at Pentecost, did he give everybody one language and that was all there was to it? No. He gave them multiple languages, diversities of tongues. But yet, if we do a comparison, if we go back to Babel, God gave a diversity of tongues to them or confused their language to scatter them. But at Pentecost, God did something different. He came down and gave them multiple tongues. But it was a sign to prove that God was God. What they had was genuine, brother Eli. And through that, he brought everybody together. Because they heard every man speaking in their own language. A tongue that they did not know before. So when we look at tongues, at Babel, God used it to divide the people. But at Pentecost, God used it to unite the church. So when we look at the diversity of tongues, I'm not going to go through all the little details. But we need to sit down once more, I feel, and we need to talk about the issue of what is the gift of tongues and what is just tongues in general. So we have a better understanding because if we're not careful, the two do seem to overlap and they can get confusing. So when we look at tongues, it occurs in 41 verses, the Greek word for tongues is glossa, it occurs in 41 verses of the New Testament. And we can go through all the different translations that it was translated into, that Greek word, tongue, tongues, with tongues, yada, yada, yada. But that is not the focus here this morning. We covered that last time we very briefly. But what is the difference of tongues? When we look at the Word of God, there are two types of tongues that are mentioned specifically. Do you remember what those two types are? I'm going to start pulling brains and trying to get interaction this morning. Rack our brain because... Really, we need a study to show ourselves the truth unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But also, we need to be ready to answer, give every man an answer of the reason of the hope that lies within us. And when we look at the word of God, it goes further in saying that the older women should teach the younger women, which to me, the flip side goes, the older men should be able to teach the younger men. But if we don't understand completely what we're talking about, how can we further instruct others? And we are living in a day and age where it's not just uh, the spirit of God that's being lost in churches, but we're losing Pentecost as a whole. How many people do you know that are baptized with the Holy Ghost to begin with, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? We are losing our heritage. So in order to pass it on, we need to understand more fully the word of God to the best of our ability. So there are two types of tongues mentioned in the word of God. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If everybody wants to turn to there, we're going to be looking at chapter 14 in greater detail, but we'll be right there in 1 Corinthians, right, right between 12 and 14. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. I will speak with the tongues of men, of angels, and have not charity, and have become the sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So there are two types of tongues mentioned in that passage. And what were they, Mom? Men, men and angels. Men and angels. I don't know about you, but to me, that pretty much sums up the entire universe. You have men, and you have angels. I mean, I'm not sure what else you get beyond that. So there are two types of tongues mentioned in the Word of God that Paul said that he will can speak with. The tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Now, when an individual speaks in tongues, who are they edifying? themselves. And where do we find that in the Word of God? If someone would please read 
1 Corinthians 14, 4. So he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Why does he only edify himself? Why doesn't he edify anybody else? If Sister Rachel comes in and she sings gets on the pulpit, sings a special, and she sings in Spanish. And it's a song that you've never heard before. You don't know the melody, you don't know the rhythm, you don't know the beat. Are you being edified by that, really? No. Why are you not being edified by it? You can't understand it. But what if she gets up here and sings in Spanish, Jesus loves me, and we recognize the tune, we recognize the melody. Are we being able to, are we able to be edified then? Yeah. Yeah. And why is that, brother? Because you don't understand what she's saying. Well, let me back up a little bit. In Spanish, sometimes, in a different language, sometimes words get reversed, get out of place. Uh, in Spanish, when you're talking about adjectives, that is, which adjectives describe a noun, the adjectives in the English language, I would say, Brother Eli, your shirt, you are wearing a purple shirt. Purple comes before the noun. But in Spanish, the adjective comes after. So you'd say whatever word for purple, D, um, whatever the word is for short. Shirt. Sure. So it's rearranged. So it's not that we understand word for word what she's saying in Spanish because to sit out there and all the way you know, we're not going to be able to understand, but we know what it is in the English. So if she's singing Jesus Love Me, it doesn't matter how the words are arranged in English in Spanish, it doesn't matter what words, sounds, and syllables are coming out of her mouth, we can relate because we know the English words for it. Put it this way, we know the interpretation of it. So we can follow the law. And so we can be edified. We're not being necessarily edified because of the words that are coming out of her mouth. We're being edified because we already know the translation. So we can already get our heart in tune with God and say, you know what, Jesus, I really do love you. And we can follow the law in that manner. So let's back up to tongues. Why, when it comes to tongues, is the person who's speaking in tongues, why is he, the, he or she the only one being edified? They're the only one that understand it. They are the, well, not even that. Not even that, Sister God, because there are times when the person who's being used in the gift of tongues, or even praying in tongues, they don't know what they're speaking. And the reason being is, it's the Holy Ghost speaking through them. We may not even know. But they're being edified because the anointing is there, God is blessing them. He's moving heavily and mightily upon them. And they are getting their own special blessing. But that is why they are the one being edified. Because the other flip side too is, if they knew what the, war, what the tongues were meant, say, let's say somebody in here is being used in the gift of tongues, they go off, yada, 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 and they know the meaning, but yet they're waiting for somebody to give the interpretation, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and we continue on with, some, with service, just like somebody would have missed it. Well, then they were supposed to give the interpretation of it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But the gift of tongues, the person who speaks in tongues does not necessarily know the interpretation to the tongues. Just like the person who's praying in tongues may not necessarily understand or even know what they're praying about. They may know the subject matter. They may not know the subject matter. They may know nothing at all because it's the Holy Ghost praying and speaking through them. Now, when it comes to the gift of tongues, the person speaking in tongues is the per only person being edified at that point. Reason being is no one else knows the interpretation. Now, 
when the gift of tongues is used, who's it meant for? And when I say that, looking for a specific answer in mind, when someone is using the gift of tongues, or let, let me just, the gift of tongues itself, is it meant for the believer, or is it meant for the unbeliever? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. We find that in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 22. Someone will please read that. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. I know. <laughs> if you would go back and read the video from two weeks ago, which is on YouTube, you would find that I would have made reference to that point that I miswrote it in your notes, and that is actually the unbeliever. So if you want to take out a marker, you can put you in right there because it's meant for the unbeliever. I got you. I'm just going up. I'm being so. But it is for the unbeliever. We find that in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Someone would please read that. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So when we look at this, we kind of go back. When somebody's using the gift of tongues, it's meant for the unbeliever. It is to show them that God is real. If we go back even to the revival in Samaria in Acts chapter 9, I believe it is. 8 or 9, one of those two. You find the sorcerer Max. And he goes, and he's actually trying to buy this. He wasn't trying to buy all the power, but he realized that they were speaking in an unknown tongue. And he tries to buy what the disciples had. And he could not. So it's the gift of tongues that is a sign to the unbeliever. Now, the gift of tongues is different from speaking in tongues. When someone, and what I mean by that is when somebody's off in their own little corner of the world, and they're praying in an unknown tongue, that is completely different than the gift of tongues itself. The gifts of the Spirit are given to profit the body of the church. But to everyone who receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the evidence of the recent of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the speaking in other tongues. We find that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And we're not going to read that passage, but let me go ahead and read Acts chapter 10. 45 and 46. Acts chapter 10, verses 45 and 46. Where the Bible states, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that of the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, and we're not going to go on with Peter's little discourse there, but what are we having discussed right here? Do you remember, if we go back and we start pulling, what just happened that Peter's giving a report of? Peter gets a vision, and God tells him, whatever I call clean, don't you call unclean. And he sends him to the Gentiles, and he goes to the house of a Roman centurion, if I remember correctly, and his name was Cornelius. And when we look at Cornelius, Cornelius he wasn't a Hebrew, which means he wasn't a Jew, but he was a Gentile. And if we go into the mindset of the Hebrews, did the Hebrews like Gentiles? No, they didn't like Gentiles. In fact, they didn't even like Samaritans, and they were half Jew and half Gentile. And it was because they were a mixed breed. But here we have a Gentile who is sincerely searching after God. He's doing it to the best of his ability. He's praying. He's fasting. So God says, you know what? 
Peter, I'm going to send you to this man. And Peter goes, and he preaches to Cornelius and his whole household. And Cornelius and his whole household, they get saved. But not only do they get saved right then and there, but they get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what is the evidence that they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the corner of verse chapter, um, verse 46? They spoke in other tongues. If we would read there is a secondary account of this, I think in Acts chapter 12 or 13. And Peter's words were, and they received the, they received salvation, or they received it just as we received, which is a reference going back to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and in other tongues. We are going to read the other passage, but we go to Acts chapter 19, verse 6, where the pastor preached from the other week. Paul reaches the shores of Ephesus. He comes upon the elders there, and he asks them, and they were baptized. And he, they say, no. He goes, oh, I think they say yes. And Paul asks, well, what baptism have you received? And they said, John's baptism, which is they receive salvation. And when Paul tells them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they said, we've not even heard such a thing. And when Paul lays his hand on them, prays for them, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and in verse 6 we find that the evidence is once again what? Tongues. Tongues is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So, when somebody receives tongues, along with when they are baptized with the Holy Ghost, that is different from the gift of tongues. And if we're not careful, we can get the two confused. Because in Scripture, sometimes it does seem a little bit murky. Sometimes it does seem like they overlap, but they don't. They are two separate things. So at baptism of the Holy Ghost, we receive the, uh, the evidence is tongues. And this tongues is between this individual and God, as we've already mentioned. They may sometimes know what they're praying about. Other times they may know absolutely nothing. But this prayer language is between the individual and God. If someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. You said 4. I'm sorry, 14. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man So when a person speaks in tongues, who are they speaking to? They're speaking to God. And he may not know because what is he, and the individual who's praying, he may not know what he's um, speaking or she's speaking and why, because they are speaking mysteries. mysteries. <coughs> And as we've already read in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, this could be a tongue of men, or it could be a tongue of angels. And just on a side note, when an individual receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, sometimes it may take a while to start praying in that prayer language. And I don't want to say, be taken the wrong way, but the more you pray, the more you use your praying language, the easier it does come. And there will come a point where if you are sincere in your relationship with God, you keep praying and using your tongues, there will be a moment that you can probably turn on just like that. The moment you go to prayer, the Holy Ghost is there and it just kicks in. But, the gift of tongues itself is different from your prayer language. It's different from the person who is speaking in an unknown tongue and praying with God because that's meant for them and God. And how, why is that different? Because the gifts of the Spirit are meant to edify the church. That is the point of the gifts of the Spirit. So when we look at the gifts of tongues, it is meant that the church would be blessed as a whole. Now, we've already mentioned the gift of tongues. When a person speaks in tongues, who are they edifying? They're edifying themselves. And when the gift of tongues is used, 
Yes, it can benefit the church, but who does the Bible specifically say that the gift of tongues is for? Believer or unbeliever? Unbeliever. Right. Unbeliever. But, but, on how do they know what it's saying unless it's being interpreted? I don't disagree with you, brother. But we don't need the gift of tongues to let us know that God's trying to communicate with us. Or that he's here. And believers will not be able to understand. I'm not saying that they'll be able to understand. But the Bible still comes back and states that the gift of tongues is meant for the unbeliever right. to show them as a sign. Yeah, but how do they know unless it's interpreted? Well, we've already talked about that a little bit, and we'll touch that again later, brother. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> it's in the notes. Just let me get there. We're going somewhere. We're rolling. <laughs> Stop pulling the brake, brother. We're rolling. No, you're good. You're good. But I'm just trying to probe right now because when we get down to it, in essence, the gift of tongues and advice, the person speaking them, and it is meant as a sign for the unbeliever. That's where we're at. <coughs> so, when we're looking at that, now, brother, I'm sure you don't know this already, but the gift of tongues and prophecy, now those are for the believers. Now where do we pull that from? We pull that from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 4 and 5. Someone will please read that. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 and 5. And you know I'm joking with you, brother. You know that. That's all. But 1 Corinthians 14, 4 and 5. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, verses 4 and 5. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would rather ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edify. So the gifts of the Spirit are meant to edify the entire church. He that speaketh is used in the gift of tongues, edifies himself. It is meant for a sign to the unbeliever. However, Paul said he'd rather that everybody prophesy so that there would be understanding. Because that's the point where we're getting at. And really when you get to the interpretation of tongues, or is that really prophecy? The only real difference is that there was a tongues given at first, so interpretation is interpreting that tongue. There are people that can have the message beforehand without the tongues and just give it, and that's prophecy. But basically they're the same thing because they're still delivering the message of God in an audible form and a language that we all can understand. Now, the reason the congregation can understand Now, the reason for edifying is because the congregation can understand the common tongue. We get that a few verses down in 8 and 9, where the Bible states, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So once again, we're coming back to the point where Paul's stressing the importance of the interpretation of the tongues and or prophecy. And that he's pushing the fact of people understanding it because if you're in the military, Back in the day, they had buglers. If the bugler did not know how to play that tune and he's making all kinds of screeches and different notes that we've never heard of before, is he really providing a message that the troops can understand? They don't know whether to assemble the battle or if it's time to all jump in the river and take a bath. They don't know if it's time to eat or if it's time to go to bed. There's no interpretation. Paul likens tongues to that if there is and the interpretation. Tongues is fine because it's a call to battle. But if we do not understand what the call is for, 
whether it's the right tune, the right notes, and everything else, then what does it profit everybody? We don't understand it. Now, with that being said, if someone is used in the gift of tongues, and there is no interpretation, do we look down on that individual? Do we look down on anybody else saying, well, they have, they've been used in gift of prophecy interpretation. Why did they interpret it? No. Is there ever an occasion where a tongues may be given and there is never an interpretation or a prophecy or an interpretation meant to be given? Let me let you stew on that a little bit. Is there ever, ever, ever any possibility that a tongues may be given? But God has never designed for interpretation to be given. What's that, Sister Rock? Yeah. Now we, now we come to the big question of every five-year-old. Why? What's that? I wouldn't go that far, brother. What I'm getting at is there's been times where God has been given, <coughs> has used somebody in the gift of tongues. And that could tie into it a little bit. But it's more so we have to come back to the understanding aspect of it. Now, if no one understands it, it's just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, for a lack of better terminology. It's just out there in the air. But there has been there have been occasions where there have been a tongues given. There's been no interpretation. And I'm sure there were people in the congregation that said, Oh, Brother Eli, he missed it this time. That's just old brother, you like getting happy again. But what they didn't realize was that there was somebody in the congregation that actually spoke that language, and that brother Eli spoke perfectly, perfectly in their own native tongues. And that message was directly for them. And while everyone else may have not understood that language, they may not have recognized it, but God was speaking directly to that individual. And there was no interpretation given, but there was only tongues. Why? Because there didn't have to be an interpretation given. Because the person that God was trying to reach understood that language perfectly. They understood, and God was dealing with them specifically in a clear, audible voice through Brother Eli speaking, but also through clear understanding that, hey, this is what I need to do to get right with God. I need to change this area of my life. So there may be times when there is the gift of tongues used and there is no interpretation. And the person who was using the gift of tongues was dead on. And no one did miss it. But God was dealing with somebody else in their own in a language that they understood. Because really when we get down to it, if God was dealing with us with a certain area in our life, nine times out of ten, is that really anybody else's business? God does, no one else really needs to know what God's dealing with us about. That's between us and God. So in a situation like that, why would everybody else in the whole church need to know? As long as they understood what was being forth, given forth in tongues, God was speaking directly to that. So there was no interpretation that was needed to be given. It, and maybe they were an unbeliever that God was trying to deal with their heart to get saved. And, you know, that was a sign right then and there. It, it was a clear sign. But maybe they have been saved for up to a million years. But God delivered a message just for that. So it is rare, but it is always a possibility. Now, we're running out of time, and we'll come back to this a little bit next week, too, because we've not gone through all the notes, and honestly, I'm not in a rush to get through my notes. We've got what we can, and we'll pick up next week. But there have been times, I can think of a, a woman who taught out of the Bible school when we were there. Her mother was used in the gift of tongues in a church service. The preacher stopped the entire service and said, you know what? She gave the message in tongues. Now she must interpret. That's not Bible. The Spirit gives to every man severally as he wills. Maybe that was the only gift that God had given her, or the Holy Ghost had given her. She was given the gift of tongues. Not everyone has the interpretation. Not everyone. No, they don't, brother. But they were taking the Bible verse, and let me go through my notes because I've been jumping around. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, 13. 
where the Bible states, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Well, we should pray, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have the interpretation. But that preacher stood up, used that verse, and said, Okay, she gave the gift of tongues. Now she has to interpret and stop the whole service. That's not right. The Holy Ghost gives to every man severally as he wills. Should the individual that's using the gift of tongues pray that the Holy Ghost give some of the interpretation? Absolutely. But so should everybody else who has been baptized with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of other tongues be praying for the same thing in that service. In fact, really, anyone who's received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we should be praying for the gifts of the Spirit to be working in our own lives. And if we've been used in several already, those that we haven't been used in, we need to be praying, God, use me in more. To whom much is given, much is required. But, you know, if we prove ourselves faithful, these gifts, they're not about us. They don't show how much holier we are than thou. We've talked before about the offices and the leadership positions of the church. We're living in a day and age where everybody wants a title. They don't want to do anything, but they want a title. That's completely opposite of what the Word of God teaches us about leadership. That's completely opposite of what God teaches us about being a Christian in general. He that is last shall be first, and he that is first, that is last. We talk, we talk and we preach about Jesus Christ, the servant leader. You know, Jesus led by being a servant. It wasn't because he was the son of God, you do what I, got, what I tell you to do. But he showed us that you lead by being a servant. He was the Son of God. Mary Magdalene came. Not Mary Magdalene. I think it was Mary the mother. Mary. What are the Marys of the Bible? Oh, Mary and Martha. She came and she anointed the feet of Jesus. Jesus didn't stop it because hey, he was the Son of God. He knew who he was. If you're in leadership, you need to know your position. There's nothing wrong with that. You're in that position. God placed you there. But Jesus also showed us that there's a time to be a servant, regardless of your position. And we find himself gathered around the table with a cloth wrapped around his glory, and he's walking the feet of the disciples. There's a time to be a servant, but there are times when we need to be in our position. Just because we're a servant doesn't mean we let everybody walk all over us. If we're in charge, we're in charge. But we still serve everybody else. The true leader will still serve everybody else by doing what is right for them. Not just looking at themselves, but doing what is right for everybody under them. But by also serving them and saying, hey, how can I meet this need of yours? How can I make sure you're doing all right? Or, I've noticed something's a little off. Are you all right? Paying attention to what? That's how we be a servant leader. Now, coming back to it and the gifts of the Spirit. We need to know who we are in Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. When we go to pray, we don't say, Oh God, oh God, I am nothing. No. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. If you've been sinning and doing wrong, well, then you know that that's a different story. But if you've been living right, if you've been reading the Bible, if you've been progressing in Jesus Christ, you know, don't let the devil tell you that you are nothing. And you're, no. We are victorious through Jesus Christ. When we go to pray, we lay it at the feet of Jesus, but we can pray with power and we can pray with authority because we know who we are in Christ. Same way with the gifts of the Spirit. When we are used, we don't bow our heads and think our but rather we give it loud, we give it boisterous because it's meant to edify the whole body. But at the same time, it is not a sign that, well, I'm bigger than you or I'm holier than thou. Because the gifts of the Spirit aren't meant to do that. The gifts of the Spirit are meant to edify the church, to build the body. And tongues comes right in line with that. Now I need to close. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? So I hope this, that this is a little bit helpful because if we're not careful, and too many people that I talk to, even Christians have been Christians for a very long time, they get the gift of tongues and tongues mixed up. And if we read the Word of God, it, if we're not careful, it's easy to do so. But I hope that this provides a little bit better understanding and help us to better um, separate the two. What is tongues and what is the gift of tongues?
And with that being said, let us bow our heads in prayer and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns one high and that there's an unlike you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds are one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our minds and our hearts will be plowed, that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be transformed even farther into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we pray this morning that you're the pastor as it brings forth the word today, anoint his mind and his lips to bring forth your message, anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, Lord, give them a special blessing as well, Lord. I pray, Lord, that all our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset, one of the four here this morning, Lord. And we rebuke every attack of the enemy, Lord, that should come our way. And we pray, Lord, that we would all, all of us that enter through these doors, would be in one mindset, one of the four, that the Holy Ghost would not be hindered in any way, Lord, but that he would be able to move freely, that he would be able to speak freely and work freely this morning. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. 